My name is John Thornton. I went to the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, and I make movies about artists with a connection to Philadelphia. So what am I doing making a movie about MICA, the Maryland Institute College of Art? A school located in a place called Balmer Merlin. My name is Stuart at Barbanel. How do people from Baltimore, is it Balmer? How do you pronounce it? <laughs> well, yeah, Baltimore. No, no, it's Balmer. <laughs> I used to watch Homicide. <laughs> that was the one word that they were able to say in Homicide, right. Balmer, Balmer, I guess is what you're looking for, right? Yes, okay, if it was Groucho, would you, the, the duck would come down. I just taught a guy from Baltimore how to say his, his city correctly. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So why am I doing this movie? Because an artist friend in Philly named Frank Hyder told me about this show he was in called Micah Then and Now. And Frank is a very persuasive guy. Plus, it turns out there's plenty of Philadelphia connected artists that went to Micah. Jane Irish, Jeffrey Reed, and David Brewster, to name a few. But first things first, the show takes place in two venues, an art gallery in the Chelsea section of New York City and a converted high school in Beacon, New York, about an hour north of the Big Apple. Barry Nemet, the chair of the painting department at MICA, curated this show. The New York gallerist, Ethan Cohen, hosted it at his two venues. My name is Ethan Cohen. I have a gallery here in Chelsea called Ethan Cohen New York, and also at the CUBE, which is the acronym for the Kunsthal Beacon. It's an art center in Beacon, New York, which has both nonprofit and profit spaces. We will have about 65 artists throughout the building. Here in New York, we have over 20 artists who have a very diverse artistic practice. It's quite exciting. We have early artwork by Morris Lewis. Barry had said, oh, he's a graduate. And that was how the idea was born into trying to highlight some of the really significant artists who have actually passed through. Here we thought it would be a great way to showcase some of the talent. And that was the reason why we created Micah Then and Now. My name is Barry Nemet. I have been teaching at MICA since 1971. I'm chair of the painting department since 1990. MICA Then and Now refers to alumni from the undergraduate department dating back to the 1800s up until 2013. Wait, excuse me, what was that? I did not include anybody who graduated less than 10 years ago. I asked each former student to provide a work of art from the past, sometime around the point at which they graduated, as well as another work much more recent. And I thought that was very interesting, the consistencies and the discrepancies. Sometimes the thread was there and uh, you could still see those passions and those particular ways of seeing the world happening today. Uh, other times, it's a huge change from then to now. I've been very influenced by Mirandi as a painter, still life, beautiful light. Then I shifted back to sculpture and combined the two. And uh, it looks very orderly, but in fact, like most people, a very schizophrenic life. I used trademark characters from the 30s and 40s and I redrew them and then made them three-dimensional. I was thinking about this hyper-happiness that we seem to be fed in the culture. I love both your old stuff and your new stuff and I would have to give you the award for most changed artist over time. Oh, thank you, thank you. Most change. That's interesting because I really don't like change in the world. <laughs>
Well, now that Stuart Abarbanel has brought up the idea of change in the world, why don't you look at some terrific art while I give you an abbreviated history of MICA. In 1826, the Maryland Institute was founded in Baltimore in order to encourage and promote the, quote, mechanic and useful arts. It cost $3 a year to attend and apparently was going gangbusters until it burned down in 1835. After a 12 year break, it got going again. Abe Lincoln gave an important speech there in 1864. It became co-ed in 1870. In 1879, it redefined itself with schools of art and design, its mission becoming, quote, laying a permanent foundation for a genuine school of high art in Baltimore. In 1895, its Alumni Association was formed, plus its Reinhardt School of Sculpture became the first graduate art program in the country. Things went swimmingly in the 20th century and in 1959 it took on something close to its current name, Maryland Institute, comma, College of Art. In the 60s, Bud Leakey, its Moses-like president, led MICA from the past into the future. Its Hofberger School of Painting formed in 1965. In 1978, Fred Lazarus becomes president. And he starts all sorts of innovative programs. By the end of the millennium, Students can study all sorts of digital and electronic arts. And in the year 2000, in a very bold move, the Maryland Institute, comma, College of Art, jettisons for all time, the comma. By 2008, MICA's MFA programs are ranked along with RISD, Yale, and the Art Institute of Chicago as the best art schools in the country. Essential to my work as a videographer is the ability to go up to total strangers, stick this into their face, and get information out of them. Usually, due to my sensitivity, it works pretty well. But occasionally, there are problems. Okay. Oh, I'm Gina Ruggieri. And I graduated from MICA in 1992. I'm, I'm going to just sorry. hold it under your <laughs> really? chin. Really? Okay. I okay. mean, I just, can I hold it, maybe? Yeah, yeah just hold it under okay. your chin. I can't. Okay, wait, hold on. That's why I knew I would feel very awkward if I wasn't in the thing. Just right. Well, okay. But patience and a bit of kindly editing does wonders. Actually, Gina had more to deal with than an obtrusive stranger. She had a whole wall of a high school gym to fill with art for Barry. This installation is comprised of works that are from the last few years, these Mylar cutout pieces, and also some very recent pieces that I had done over the summer. Silkscreen mesh on canvas. So Barry, when he offered me the 80 foot long wall, something that was a surprise and also a challenge and ultimately sort of interesting was the fact of the brick wall and all the gymnasium fixings, the things on the hoops and the vents and the bleachers and the different kinds of brick were a surprise and something I had to play with in a certain way in terms of the installation. There are so many wonderful artists in this show, but I got to talk to only a few. 
Hi, my name is Aaron Fink. The graduated class of 77. There's two pieces of mine in the show here. One is a landscape from 1975, and the other one is 2008. My daughter had a summer job working at this hamburger joint, so I go in there sometimes and get lunch when she's working there. So I took this picture of a cheeseburger and took it home and it just, you know, <laughs> inspired me. David Humphrey is a well-known artist who lives and shows in New York. I'm happy to also be showing here a couple of my sculptures, which I never had a chance to study at MICA, but I went to MICA believing that this was the place for sculpture. Somehow along the way, I was seduced by painting, and so it took me another 10 years to come around to making sculpture right properly, even though that was what had in fact gotten me into MICA in the first place. I feel like I'm a dating service for found ceramics. I found at a flea market this squirrel planter and then these strange dachshund objects and I joined them together according to the dynamic principles of modern art. Hopefully they will live happily ever after. So it's very much a, about a love of nature. Love of nature mica style. Yes. <laughs> What's your name? Jason Peters. I'm an installation artist, do a lot with light-based work, which is what's at view up at the Kunsthalle and Beacon, the glass house that's up on the roof. So I installed a piece in there, which is very intriguing at, during the daytime, but at night it really starts to become more alive because it relies on the darkness and the negative space that is created by that. Then the other added benefit was that the glass started reflecting, so there's a nice refracting quality within the work. Micah has great teachers. By pushing me, I just started figuring out, but that's not good enough, or I know you have more in you, which is what a lot of the teachers do. It's more about just trying to get it out of you, whatever it is, and not so much defining it. Tony Shore is a great artist, born and raised on the tough streets of Balmer, Merlin. Tony, are you the beater or the BT? Uh, I was the witness. <laughs> a lot of the scenes come from things that I saw growing up in South Baltimore. It was a pretty rough neighborhood, working class, some would say white trash. A little neighborhood called Marl Park, right next to Pigtown. How does a kid from near Pigtown end up at Micah? I went to the Baltimore School for the Arts for high school. And at that time, once every four years, they'd give a full scholarship to Micah. And I was fortunate enough to get one of those scholarships, which allowed me to go to Micah for four years and then go to Yale for grad school, too. The choice to paint on black velvet, was that a stick in the eye of the art world? Originally, the idea was that I was going to paint people on black velvet who would own black velvet. I mean, the neighborhood that I grew up in, black velvet was a pretty common thing to have on your wall. Whether it was Elvis, John F. Kennedy, or the Virgin Mary, if it hung on your wall, it was still this possession of the family. In the early stages, they had a much more cartoon aesthetic and sort of caricature feeling. But I had this growing respect for both the people that I was painting and also the material I was working with. So in the end, I liked the idea that I was going to take these people and paint them with the same dignity that Velasquez would paint a king. And I would take this lowbrow material and treat it like it was fine linen. Fouad Khan is a gifted artist who painted an installation in the Beacon Cube staircase. My name is Fawad Khan. I'm a painter and a drawer. I went to MICA from 97 to 2001 and studied with Barry and, and many of other faculty that are here tonight. Most of my work now comes out of a personal catharsis and response to media observations, my own personal travels even. We strategically decided to play sketchbooks from my time at MICA because a lot of those sketchbooks come out of a very peripatetic time where I was traveling a lot, I was speaking to people, I was documenting, uh, much like a visual journalist. These days, and I'm in the studio. So I'm constantly doing the same thing with my mind and with my studio practice, but I'm doing it behind closed doors. And so I thought that would be a great way to connect to the then and now concept. Showcase these sketchbooks and then alongside newer works that are meant for the gallery wall and for discourse with the public to let them in. I was born in 1978 in Tripoli, Libya, to an Indian father and a Pakistani Kashmiri mother. Uh, I lived in Pakistan for a while, moved to the States when I was age of eight. I started speaking English around that time and decided on an art education when it came to college. I moved to New York in 2001 for my master's and I've been here ever since. I asked him about how his watercolor paintings have decorated lorries seem to have 
an explosive quality. Well, I like the work. It tours with the audience. You get close and you think it's beautiful. It's explosive and it attracts us much like the macabre does on media and on television. We want to see what's happening and you get up close and it's a punch in the gut. Frank Heider has a number of works in these two shows. In Beacon are his paintings on Mylar, which are installed in the windows of the gymnasium, and his inflatable sculptures. In Chelsea, he created a new work with a keen moral presence. It is uh, based on Trayvon Martin. I've been living in Florida. The feelings that I have that someone could just be shot because they were walking down the street wearing a hood, to me, just seems completely wrong. As an artist, I can't do anything to change the law, but I can make an art piece. I think I've spotted the provost of Micah. What exactly does a provost have to do? And is it a pretty easy job? Or... <laughs> I'm responsible for everything to do with the educational program. All the faculty, all of the classes, all of the library, all of the galleries. Sometimes it's easy. <laughs> Sometimes it's fun. But I'm also an old Micah faculty member. So there are works in here by people who are former students of mine. People on the faculty, like Howie Weiss, has a painting in here that is actually produced in my class when he was a student 40 years ago. Well, I'm Howie Lee Weiss. I might be one of the oldest people in the show. The early piece is from 1973, and the newest piece is from 2013, so that's a pretty wide spread of work. But it's interesting how they still connect to each other. I went to undergrad school at MICA, then I did my graduate work at Yale University, then I came back to teach in 1979, 35 years ago. So a lot of the people in this show were also my students. It's kind of like a reunion of sorts for me. Gerard and I work together. Uh, this is sort of what I've been doing recently in the last, what, three years. And uh, it's kind of an amazing experience to work on a painting with another painter. Don't you get in each other's way? Don't you fight? Don't you have arguments about what you can do? And the answer is, of course. But we manage to understand each other and, and let each other get away with a lot of things that you know maybe other people wouldn't let each other yeah. get away with. So we're, we're kind of like brothers connected through just you know passion to paint. Was it fun going to the Maryland Institute College of Art? It was totally fun. The atmosphere of creativity, you can't beat that. I was in undergraduate school at the Fallsway building, must have been 12 or 15 of us, in open studios. And Donald Batchelor was one of my studio mates. And one time I remember he came over and said something about the piece that's actually going to be hanging at Beacon. Said that I should move away from painting Jasper John's paintings. It's funny that I remember that, and now I can't even remember where I put my keys. <laughs> I work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I'm the stage manager for concerts and lectures. My experience at MICA and my experience at looking at all of the art around the museum and what I've taken in over the years has helped me with my artwork tremendously. I'm David Merrill, son of the late artist Herman Merrill. I'm president of the Herman Merrill Foundation. My father's major focus, I believe, was eliminating unnecessary detail, which at times makes the work deceptively simple, but it's actually extremely profound, I think. My father was a studio painter. He would travel and keep things in his mind, and he might make a rough note or two on the back of an envelope with an India ink pen, but he came back and recreated things in his own format. He always said, you can't wait for inspiration. Inspiration comes while you're working. He was very serious when he painted, but he was happy. I'm paraphrasing one of his comments. He says, painting is a struggle, but it's a very enjoyable struggle. The realist painter, Peter Greaves, has one particularly striking full-length portrait. His model shared some interesting scuttlebutt with me. Hi, I'm Carly Silverman. Peter took pictures for the painting, but he had a process where he came over and searched through my closet and found a number of little nightgown dresses. It's kind of funny 
situation, but I went over to his place and posed in a lot of different dresses. He took tons of photographs, but I think he likes to work alone and from the photographs, so after that I hadn't seen the painting until it was hanging in Forum Gallery. It was crazy because I was like, oh, that's me. that I was lucky over many years, over 43 years, to have students like Su Jin Lee. Hi, uh, my name is Su Jin Lee. I graduated from MICA in 2001, and I have a book that I made in my senior year here, and it's an artist book. I use newsprint for the pages, and I use rubber stamp, and I printed, stamped each letter one by one. I turned that piece into a video, I guess I was more interested in written text when I was in college and I made artist books and installations. I combine text, video, and performance. <laughs> to discuss the complexity of performing language through different cultural and linguistic systems. I am interested in the elements that spoken words hold. Do Su Jin Lee graciously is letting me use the footage she took of the artist Jane Irish. Hi, I'm Jane Irish, and I'm an artist who went to Maryland Institute, graduated in 1977, and it's such an honor to be part of this show. These architecture paintings, which I show in this Then and Now exhibit, I think that's the thread to connect the social history with a beauty of painting that I learned at MICA. I'm showing large paintings and ceramics in the gym. I'll talk about what I'm showing in the hallway. It's about a 60-foot ink drawing. The piece itself is kind of like an epic narrative about the Vietnam War aftermath and beginnings. It commemorates the Vietnam veterans against the war. There are veterans who fought in the war, but when they came home, fought against it to stop it, to save the lives of their buddies that were still there. I've done that in a visual, poetic way, and I incorporate veterans' poetry in the pieces. I'm just trying to find a new narrative way to tell a story of history, kind of invent a new form of history painting. Micah clearly has some very high-profile graduates. The sculpture Balloon Dog by Jeff Koons just sold for $58.4 million, which set a new record for a living American artist. And yet, I tend to agree with Barry Nemet on this subject. And there are many terrific artists who don't necessarily make a big reputation, doesn't diminish their talent, because I don't equate how good someone is with the size of their reputation. Confusing the value of art with the price of art is a big mistake. Art is what makes us human, and the many talented artists that have been trained at MICA give us something to nourish our minds, hearts, and souls.
ultimately, Micah then and now is a result of the generosity of spirit and dedication to his students of Professor Barry Nemet. Not all the artists in the show were my students, but it certainly gave me a feeling of excitement to see work in 2013 from someone who I had as a student in 1971 when I began teaching. It's a thrilling experience for anybody who loves art to see the development. You never can really anticipate it. And the feelings clearly go both ways. Every artist I spoke to expressed great gratitude towards Barry. Here's just a few voices from the chorus. I'm David Humphrey. Barry Nemet was a very exciting teacher for me. He was the teacher who shepherded my transition from being an obedient good student to being an artist with my own initiative. And his encouragement helped me to launch from there to New York City and being an artist now. Well, I'm Howie Lee Weiss. There's only one person in the world could have collated this whole show. It could have never happened if Barry didn't do it. I think most people did it just to take part in something that he was involved in. Michael Frank. It's great to be part of this exhibition for really one major reason, and that's my friend and former teacher, Barry Nemet. He was so influential for me and for all of these artists, I would think. We've remained friends over, what, 35 years? And he's just got such a big heart, and he's such a great guy. He's got such a great eye that this show is high quality because of that. And he's just amazing. Micah then and now allowed me to take stock of 43 years of devoting myself to an institution in which I believe deeply, almost like a reunion, bring back a whole bunch of people into my life, introduce them to one another. Sometimes a younger artist I knew liked the work of a certain older artist, so I'd bring them together. That was a joy. People came up to help me not just hang their work, but their colleagues' work. I actually was very impressed by and touched by the generosity of the artists in the show. You are an incredibly nice guy, so I'm going to ask you, are any of the artists in this show, do you remember them as being royal pains in the ass when they were students? And you don't have to name names, but yes or no? No. Pure delight to work with. I know it sounds like I'm just flattering the people, but it's true. This was a joy. I'm an outsider as far as the MICA community goes, but working on this film was a great joy for me. I was really bowled over by the quality and variety of the work. Making a film about this many artists is challenging. And so I think I'll let the last word be from an artist who's also an outsider and whose process mirrors my own. And going back and forth and really pushing off a dance, like a dance, and going through the process without knowing where we're going, you know, so until the end, right? <laughs>